Hello, and welcome back to the Ambassadors of Gaming. I'm one in uh, your collection of hosts, Ambassador Michael. And today, I want to speak about uh, somebody in the games industry that has been a, a powerhouse, a very important figurehead, uh, Phil Spencer. And uh, this has been in the pipeline for quite a while, but um, I've wanted to talk about Phil and how he's redirected Xbox and... I've never really ended up getting around to it, and now just seems like the perfect time because we're on the cusp of Xbox Series X. Uh, we've really gotten time to see kind of how he works with the Xbox team, what his plans were, what his vision is, and kind of how he leads that team and, and leads those efforts. And so now I think is the perfect time to look back at kind of the moves he was making, kind of understand what he dealt with as a leader and kind of the situation the Xbox brand was in at the time and kind of where it is now. So we're going to take a pretty deep dive here. This is quite a length, it's going to be probably quite a lengthy video. I haven't edited yet. Obviously, we're doing the intro here. So I hope uh, you will find it entertaining. Please, of course, engagement is super important to us. Every little bit helps. You know, when you get through the video, please like, share, subscribe, all that kind of stuff. It, it's really, really helpful. I know it's a pain in the ass. Everybody hates to hear it. So let's just go straight into the video. So I think the most important aspect is to, to look prior to Spencer's rise and um, eventual succession uh, of previous Xbox leadership. So I want to start with the announcement of the Xbox One. Well, I don't want to go any further than that because I think it's not related. I think the announcement of the Xbox One to where we're going to see kind of near, we're nearing the end of the, the popularity of the Xbox One's life cycle. This, that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's start with there with the announcement. As we all know, the, the original announcement and layout plan for the Xbox One was vastly different from the one we got at launch and even more different than the current Xbox One. And we have both Dan, uh, Don? Don, Dan Metric. I'm sorry. I fucked his name up so many times. I've been saying his name wrong for like years. I thought it was Don Matic, but it's Dan Metric. <laughs> uh, and Phil Spencer to thank for that. So the Xbox One had the usual fancy wording and technology was positioned as this futuristic all-in-one box, handling your TV, your subscriptions, Netflix, Hulu, all that kind of stuff, YouTube, and also it played games. The Kinect was originally intended to be hardwired into the system. The Kinect 2.0 was meant to be vital to the Xbox One, using it to turn the system on, change between apps, uh, enable Snap, a feature that allowed you to watch videos in a smaller section like a picture-in-picture, one of the best features of the Xbox One, in my opinion. Change volume or channels for your television set. And the Kinect also allowed for motion gestures to be used, so you didn't have to pick up a controller or a remote. The OS was even designed uh, intently to be used with these, these grab motions with the Kinect. There were, of course, uh, privacy concerns regarding the Kinect system, as we just dealt with the reveal of the NSA spying by Edward Snowden. So this led to many users feeling the Kinect could record or spy on them without their permission and worried about how their data could be used. Microsoft repeatedly mentioned that the company would not store information from the Kinect, though many were distrustful. During the months leading up to the launch of the Xbox One, the company backtracked and eventually removed the Kinect from being hardwired into the system, but it did require it to be bundled with every system, inflating the price to $500 a piece, while competing with the more powerful PS4 at $400. The system was also revealed to have a complex system of buying and playing used games. Using an online system to check that the disc was authentic and essentially had a digital download code attached to it that could only be used once. The system required users to be connected to the internet at least once every 24 hours to use it, in addition to the restrictions on used games. The system also did not have a hard drive that could be replaced by users versus the PS4, where uh, Sony even encouraged it. They have tutorial videos on how to replace the, the hard drive in your PS4. They've, they made it more simplistic, whereas the original design for the Xbox One did not. Dametric retired from Xbox prior to its launch, so roughly around the summer of uh, 2013. Now, he was the face of Xbox at the time and was very dismissive towards the criticisms of the system, and even in the face of all the adversity, he kind of never really bowed to it. As you will recall, there is not the now infamous line from Metric where he told the Marine, quote, Seriously, when I read the blogs and thought about who's really the most impacted here, there was a person who said, hey, I'm on a nuclear sub. And I don't even know what it means to be on a nuclear sub, but I've got to imagine it's not an easy place to get an internet connection. But hey, I can empathize. If I was on a sub, 
I'd be disappointed. End quote. He went on to say, quote, Fortunately, we have a product for people who aren't able to get some form of connectivity. It's called the Xbox 360. End quote. As you can imagine, this didn't go over well with quite many people. They, they felt uh, shafted, left behind, and uh, frankly, many were offended by uh, his remarks, considering that they had just spent you know hundreds of dollars on the system and games and things of this nature and been involved in this ecosystem. They felt betrayed by a company that they had trusted and, and spent a lot of time and effort in. Now, of course, everybody didn't feel that way, but uh, enough people did that, uh, as we've seen, it made a shift. It made the public shift. And this kind of all happened again before the system even launched. So, uh, you know, they were dealing with a lot of issues from decisions that they made that just uh, really this time period puts them into this hole that's very, very hard for Phil and everybody to climb out of. So shortly after these exchanges, Matrick announced that he would be leaving Microsoft to join uh, Zynga, the mobile developer. This put Microsoft in a strange position of having a new leader prior to the launch of their new system that was getting pretty negative press at the time. This is when Phil Spencer was chosen to be the new face of Xbox and lead the hardware and brown side of the operation. It did take, however, almost an additional year for Phil Spencer to take over the entirety of Xbox, including studios, Xbox Live, and all functionalities under the Xbox brand. So Phil Spencer took head kind of around the time of launch, and then roughly about six months later, uh, after the, after about six months after the launch of the Xbox One. So, you know, it, it, this was in March. 2014-ish is when Phil Spencer really took ha- a hold of Xbox as a brand, as a, as a company, and he became the figurehead. So Phil Spencer came in and started making moves as soon as he possibly could after his appointment to the head of Xbox in March 2014. And his first move was to get the Kinect out of the box, out of the packaging, and lower the price of the Xbox One to be more competitive. With the Kinect gone, the system immediately dropped in price to a much more affordable and comparable price to the PS4. With this, it also allowed developers to harness more of the Xbox One's power towards games instead of Kinect functionality, as the Kinect at that time was using power and um, was dealing with CPU and GPU kind of stuff and stuff that's way above my pay grade. But the short version is the Kinect was eating power and this freed up stuff so that they could implement things into the games. So the Kinect then was released on its own about a month later, and uh, Microsoft justified this as a way that users could, quote, upgrade their system. To, with the Kinect. Changes to uh, games were also made. Spencer would eventually announce a slew of cancellations for games that the company did not feel were worth continuing to invest in. Scalebound and Fable Legends were two of those games. Uh, Scalebound was a game by Platinum Games that kind of looked like it might be their version of a, a DMC with a dragon kind of thing going on. And uh, uh, apparently Phil Spencer and Microsoft just didn't feel that it was living up to its original expectations and promises, and so they pulled the plug. Obviously, this was a disappointment as at the time, Microsoft was still dealing with the Xbox One backlash and dealing with the fact that they weren't really getting many exclusives. And so this kind of came into a point where it it started looking even worse for them. The next thing that was changed uh, majorly in the, the Xbox ecosystem was the UI. The original Xbox One UI was designed to intently work with the Kinect. With the focus on Kinect waning and eventually disappearing, the system had to be reworked and remove features. The gesture control was removed completely, Cortana uh, Cortana was added and then removed from the system. The operating system switched from a variation of the awful Windows 8 to Windows 10. This also caused some features to be dropped, such as the wonderful snap. So the system could gain some of its power to compete with the PS4, the base level Xbox One and the base level PS4. Many of the original entertainment features of the Xbox One were also delayed indefinitely or completely cancelled, such as DVR support. In 2015, Spencer announced that he and the team had worked on backwards compatibility coming to Xbox One. The feature was an emulator built into the system software to run the games and allow for certain games that could not be essentially automatically ported, identified, and then later updated to meet the newer systems, the Xbox One S and the Xbox One X, uh, their power. The feature came to the system at the end of 2015, sporting only Xbox 360 games. However, original Xbox games would be announced later to be able to run on a different emulator in 2017. This was a huge undertaking that was delayed uh, before Spencer had kind of taken hold, and he decided to reinitiate the program and uh, have the program uh, started working on, and there was a lot of... There's a great story about it. Uh, I really recommend you guys read it. It's really, really in-depth and detailed. 
but I, to save time here, we're not going to go over it. But just know that this was something that Phil Spencer felt was very, very important to Xbox. He made sure that it got done. So the next major overhaul was to completely ditch everything but the Xbox One game. So at this point, the Xbox One is vastly different from what it originally was. The UI is different. Uh, the system is still basically the same, but they've made a lot of changes. They had a, an Xbox One controller with a 3.5 millimeter head port that they released and they were releasing 3.5 millimeter headsets in their system. And then they backtracked that, made some changes and actually changed the headset back to a special adapter for the Xbox One controller. So there were a lot of stuff that, that was happening, even minor stuff that people didn't really think about or, or care about, but th that Microsoft and I assume the team at Xbox and Phil Spencer put a lot of thought into. So this was their, their next big undertaking was the Xbox One rebrand. Uh, so the Xbox One S, with all of these changes, Microsoft had to do some visual work as well. They wanted to distance itself from the original Xbox One and show the growth that they've had in the last handful of years. So the company unveiled the Xbox One S. The redesign of the original system with some modest improvements. The console moved this power supply inside, so it was uh, a smaller, sleeker design. They redesigned the chassis to be much more modern and sleek. They punched it full of holes. It looks really nice. And they made a system that was more comparable to the PS4 at launch. And they figured out a way to just do it. Uh, one of the things that you'll see reiterated throughout this video is, is that with Phil Spencer and that team, they just found a way to do it. I don't know how, because I don't understand the technical sides of a lot of this stuff, but they had a vision, they enacted that vision, and they found a way that for that vision to be um, executed. So the console would remove the connect port, actually, and you would have to buy an adapter to use it, thus kind of killing off the, the last bit of the original design. It also added HDR to the system and 4K video. Uh, so the Blu-ray player was actually upgraded to 4K, and you could also stream 4K content. At this time, Microsoft also unveiled that they were working on a mid-generation upgrade codenamed Project Scorpio. Project Scorpio would then become, obviously, the Xbox One X. The mid-generation upgrade that became the Xbox One X was a much more powerful system that allowed developers to take advantage of the system and run games natively at 4K along with pushing some games to 60 frames per second regularly, as well as 4K. Microsoft touted this as the most powerful system they had ever made. The system would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the PS4 Pro, and turning out to be a much more powerful system than the Pro and allowing Microsoft to get some bragging rights back. And there were also a handful of decisions we're going to go through here that uh, many people thought would be disastrous or, or would be ruinous for the company and have actually turned out to not be a problem at all. And I was included in some of that. And the first one is Xbox Play Anywhere. A lot of people thought this was a, a bad idea. And so let's explain why. The company announced during the 2016 E3 presentation that the company would launch their first party titles on both PC and Xbox, causing some to claim that the system would never truly have exclusives again and that there was no real reason to buy an Xbox One. Uh, obviously we've seen that that's just not the case. Uh, Xbox Ones are still selling, the Xbox One S is still doing quite well, the Xbox One X is doing decently well for a mid-tier upgrade. And so the Xbox Play Anywhere really just became about allowing accessibility and kind of enabling people to purchase games and, and have games accessible to them on PC as well as on their Xbox and, and allow them to play where they want to, literally play anywhere is, is their eventual goal, as we'll get into later on. Um, but Microsoft is thinking about Xbox as a brand, as a company, and, and utilizing the synergy they have with Microsoft and Windows. And I, it, it turned out to be a really smart idea that we all criticized at the time as, as foolish. And really, we're not seeing the, the fruits of that in the way that we thought. Um, it, it really hasn't affected the Xbox community much at all. Uh, if you're unaware, uh, building a powerful PC is not cheap. It's roughly about two times the, the price of an Xbox One X at the moment. And so it's just not feasible for a lot of people. They, they don't need to buy a thousand dollar computer when they could just buy a $500 Xbox and get what they need out of it. So uh, I think a lot of the conventional wisdom on that was just wrong. Uh, at least we haven't we haven't seen any numbers to suggest that it's been right. So uh, the next one around was when Microsoft took off the kitty gloves, in my opinion. And they said, all right, look, we're not screwing around. And so they revealed all the surprises that Microsoft had been cooking up. And their biggest reveal, in my opinion, has been 
the Netflix for games, Xbox Game Pass. A monthly subscription allowing users to download games from the Xbox One to the original Xbox, Xbox 360 included. Uh, the subscription also became the place where the company would launch all of its first party games day and date. Microsoft later went on to bundle this uh, with the $10 a month uh, Xbox Live Gold as it was a $10 a month subscription itself for a cheaper $15 a month Game Pass Ultimate. So Game Pass ultimately became this, this tentpole for, for Microsoft and kind of Xbox and it's really been uh, a pillar and it's been great and I, I think it's really forward thinking and again we thought that this would include a, a loss of sales for Microsoft. But it seems that Microsoft is happy with the results. Uh, as they said, you know, Gears 5 had a record number of engagements with it, uh, players active and things like that due to Game Pass. So I, I think that ultimately this is allowing them to do exactly what they wanted, pull more people into games that they normally wouldn't play, play because they didn't want to pay for them. Now they feel that they've already bought it and they're like, well, I bought it. I might as well. It's, it's technically free, whatever. I'll check it out. So this has been a move for them that's really been a powerhouse move and there's nobody competing with them in this space right now uh, outside of like playstation giving the free games every month but playstation now is not this it it's a kind of a competitor but not really playstation now is an answer to backwards compatibility whereas game pass is an answer to uh, the people who just can't afford to stay up with current gen games because it's expensive uh, you know, we do the numbers here at AOG and it, we spend way more money than you would really think on, on games. And that's not just for our personal entertainment, but also for coverage and things like that. So Game Pass adds that value to the, the day-to-day person that I think uh, a lot of media figureheads couldn't, couldn't think about. And so Game Pass has really just become this thing that's just like, it's another thing I want to have. It's another subscription or whatever. So Microsoft made the right move here. In the fall of 2018, Microsoft announced the limited time Xbox All Access program, which allowed people in the United States to purchase the console on a financing plan with monthly payments at a 0% interest rate. This included their choice of an Xbox One S or X with Game Pass and an Xbox Live. Consumers could pay this off over a two year time span. This program was also reinitiated recently to allow users to purchase an Xbox One S or an Xbox One X and upgrade if they have an Xbox One X to the Xbox Series X when it launches. This is a program that uh, Microsoft has kind of pushed out and taken back and pushed out. And so it may be a limited time program, we're not sure, but it is a way to introduce people who can't afford it at, up front and at launch. And when we looked at the pricing, I think it was a roughly about 30 bucks a month, $32 a month for the Xbox One X. And so realistically, you're only paying about $17 a month. Um, for the console because you're already paying technically 15 for Game Pass Ultimate. So it, it was relative. it's relatively well done price-wise. I think that it's something they really want to do, but I think one of the hindrances is you have to have a lot, it, it has to be run on a line of credit. So it complicates things a bit. But at the end of the day, this is a move that they're experimenting with that nobody else is. And I think it's something that opens the door to a lot of people so that people who can't afford to do it normally can. And so they don't have to save up six, seven hundred dollars, whatever it is to buy the new console, buy a, co- a new control, an additional controller, a couple of games, buy Xbox Live, things like that. And so Xbox All Access, I think, uh, may become something that's super important to the way they sell these consoles. So. Uh, lastly, uh, on the console side, they introduced the Xbox One S All Digital, which was Microsoft continuing to innovate and trying new approaches to their systems, giving users genuine choices on how they want to purchase and play their games. The company introduced the All Digital Xbox One S as a cheaper alternative to the disc-based system. I don't recall the number off the top of my head, uh, but the idea was that it should it was relatively cheaper than the Xbox One S. And the whole point was that you could come in day and date and buy the system for, I think, about 250, 200, something like that, US dollars, and have something to go that you could just download a bunch of games, play them, and you'll have Game Pass. So you'll be able to download this library of games. You know, have Xbox like Gold, so you'll be getting free games every month. And with that, it, it, it included, this became the culmination, in my opinion, of 
everything they had worked for already. They're like, all right, look, th this is for the people who are in the know, who want this kind of stuff, who are ready to just go digital and embrace it. Here it is, it's cheaper. Join us on the Xbox ecosystem. And so I'm really interested to see how they take this forward with their next gen systems. Uh, I, I think these are the kind of ideals you'll see uh, kind of implemented in, in certain areas here. Uh, obviously, as we know, there's rumors that these, the new next generation Xbox will be twofold, just like the current gen, where there will be a uh, less powerful, cheaper model and a more expensive, powerful model. So we'll have to see. Uh, Project xCloud was the last big innovation that, that they've announced so far. And Project X Cloud was released in 2019 as a streaming service that can be played via a mobile device and an Xbox controller. Players currently have a set selection of games they can choose from and play on the device. The big news that Microsoft dropped on us this year was that the service will also be included in Xbox Game Pass as a benefit. So it's not an additional cost, it's just something being added to what you already have. Um, which is, I, I can't understate how massive that is because it's so expensive testing this thing. They've been testing this thing for at this point, probably years, but the, in the phase of being able to actually play and actually do stuff has been well over a year. And now it's just starting to become rolling out beta access wise, and it's going to start getting included and, and rolled into what their, their uh, original vision for it. So it kind of connects you. And I think the idea ultimately is to allow you to Play Xbox on your TV, play Xbox on your PC, play Xbox on your phone when you're away. And that kind of eliminates the need for them to offer a mobile device. It also allows them to uh, have cloud saves brought with you so you can play your games elsewhere. And it, it's just xCloud being a feature that's added and not an additional cost is really, really central to Microsoft's themes of focusing on we're here to present you with ways to play games and bring you great experiences while you're playing those games. And a lot, of, a lot of times we've taken that and companies have said that to us and they haven't acted on it. We've seen that with PlayStation actually this generation where we, as PlayStation gamers, we kind of felt that way at the beginning and kind of as time's gone on, they've seemed to kind of wane on that message. Whereas Xbox seemed pretty arrogant as you've seen since the beginning of this. And they took a hard hit they sat down at the table, they figured out what their vision was, they drew it up, they enacted it, and they made it. And now they're just in the phase of, of putting all those pieces together and being like, look, we're showing you, every couple of months we're showing you, hey, here's this new thing, here's here's what we're working on, here's some new stuff on xCloud, here's some new stuff on Game Pass, here's our new games that are coming out of our studios. And so Microsoft is really, really reinvested in Xbox instead of just thinking of it as a as a side business. And this was seen by Spencer's appointment to the board. Uh, he originally wasn't sitting with the board to d discuss kind of issues and, and stuff like that. And he wasn't really a part of that. Xbox never really was a part of that. But they restructured Microsoft and they're like, we should really have this be a part of the table. And so Microsoft has really considered Xbox a viable part of their business. And I think with all these things we've listed so far here today, you see the kind of investment that the company is making and, and the vision that Spencer and his team has and, and kind of how they're not only executing it, but doing it well. So I think this ultimately leads into obviously what we're going to get this fall, which is the newest console. And so the Xbox Series X will be the first time Spencer and his team is able to make decisions not based on their predecessors completely. The console will ref it clearly reflects the design decisions on the Xbox One S and X. And it seems clear to me that now that they're, they're able to kind of break off the shackles, the last shackles of the Xbox One, um, they're able to enact a vision that allows them to have a coherent ecosystem. At least that's my hope. And that's kind of how they've spoken about it so far. So obviously we won't know too much until they, they speak more about it. We're assuming E3 is kind of where they'll, they'll dump all the info on us about Series X and show games and all this kind of stuff. So um, please 
let us know what you think. Uh, let us know what you think of Phil Spencer. Um, I, I did this video because I do actually have admirations for him as a as a business person and as somebody who, who works uh, around planning and, and distributing content and all that kind of stuff. I can't imagine the kind of undertaking it must be uh, what his position is. And so I'd love to hear from what you guys think of him, how you think Xbox has handled uh, this generation, all that kind of stuff. I really think that uh, going forward, it, it's going to be a different story. I think Xbox is going to have a different face uh, this gen forward. And I think that they've really been slept on this generation because of the fault of the original Xbox One and kind of what the, the vision was for it. And I think that team and Phil Spencer are really going to show you we're serious. We're, we're, we're here to stay. So uh, until next time, friends, I'm Ambassador Michael. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video. Again, please, any engagement you can give us would be great. We also have a Patreon where you can fund us and um, you can get some additional content as well. So yeah, that's it. Bye.